It's been a big week in vaccine news. We have two paired papers in the New England Journal of Medicine about myocarditis. We have Swedish reports and Denmark reports that they are no longer going to be offering the Moderna vaccine to people under the age of 30. What does this all mean? Well, as many of you all know, I've been interested in following very closely the mRNA myocarditis saga. I have had my eye on it for quite some time and published a number of op-eds and commentaries on this topic. So naturally, I'm going to be interested in the developments of this week. What should I tell you? First, let's back up and let's review what's been going on. Um, I think some of us were first aware of the signal that mRNA vaccination, particularly in boys and particularly of a certain age, between the age of, say, 12 and 28, um, or 12 and 30, that there was a safety signal there. And that safety signal was myocarditis. Um, the initial reports came out in early February in uh, Israeli news coverage. It was corroborated by Reuters in April. By May, the EMA had launched an inquiry. That was around the time that Wes Pegden, myself, and Steph Brawl wrote about the use of emergency use authorization in younger age groups for the British Medical Journal. Uh, and into the summer, when I, with several co-authors, wrote a provocative piece um, that the CDC should consider alternative dosing strategies particularly for boys, particularly for this age group where there is a vulnerability to myocarditis, um, we suggested that they consider a one-dose strategy. Well, fast forward, now we have seen the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, Norway have in fact considered this one-dose strategy and have moved forward with one dose out of the risk of myocarditis. Just this week we learned Sweden and Denmark were no longer recommending one of the two mRNA vaccines, the Moderna vaccine, to people under the age of 30 out of risk of myocarditis. It appears in a number of data sets that the Moderna vaccination has a slightly higher risk of that adverse outcome. And I think, <clears throat> and the biggest bombshell this week, are the two Israeli studies and a New York Times article that has finally allowed us to talk more openly about this. This is by uh, Apoor Vamanvi, and it has quotes from Waleed Jalad, um, and I think they're good quotes about why we need to be open and able to discuss whether or not a two-dose strategy is the optimum strategy in this age group, or whether or not a one-dose strategy might give you most of the benefit of vaccination, but mitigate a large percentage of the downside. So, what are my thoughts here? I have several thoughts. <clears throat> One, I think... Um, vaccination is an important good. And I've said that on many shows, and I particularly think that's important for older people. And I myself rushed to get myself vaccinated. At the same time, I think it's important not to let that enthusiasm come at the price of a total lack of critical thinking. Even if something is good, it doesn't mean you cannot keep an eye on adverse effects that may come down the pipe. And I think we did face a huge reluctance to have an honest discussion about myocarditis. Some people felt like even acknowledging it might be a threat to vaccination. I think that is misguided. And if anything, it creates a sense of distrust and is, a, is, a, is just a bad thing to do as a scientist. Um, we followed this for quite some time uh, before I actually commented publicly about it in the summer of this year, where I thought it is a real safety concern. One of the reports out of Israel shows that uh, at least one boy um, who has myocarditis got very, very sick, and uh, some boys have uh, some uh, changes on MRI of their heart. I think it is important to acknowledge that we do not fully know all of the long-term implications for those cardiac changes in some subset of kids with myocarditis. Uh, could some subset have some long-term deleterious impact? That is an important and open scientific question. We should not minimize that scientific question. And I think so that's been one important part of the narrative. The next part is the actual frequency of this event. Now, many of you all know I have been following all of the studies, including the preprint by John Mandrola, Tracy Beth Hogg, Ali Krug, Josh Stevenson, which suggested that the incidence was something around 1 in 6,800 or so in the age group of 12 to 15, uh, perhaps 1 in 7,000-ish. That was the ballpark that they were in. That figure appears to be firmly corroborated by the fi Pfizer data in the New England Journal of this week. Uh, that is, in fact, the number. It's very, very close. The real rate of this incidence in, in this age group of boys is something between one in 6,000, one in 10,000 ish. That's the ballpark. Now, of course, um, different studies will have different point estimates, but that's a reasonable ballpark. So I again say that um, 
They were wrongly impugned. They were heavily criticized for their VAERS analysis, which I believe did not inappropriately use VAERS. It appropriately uses VAERS because it was reviewed by an expert cardiologist, John Mandrola. And now I think they have been fully and completely vindicated that their estimate was very, very close to multiple converging estimates from multiple different systems. And I think it was unfair, their treatment, and profoundly anti-science, in my opinion, um, to to have criticized them so vociferously, predominantly because you didn't want to accept their conclusion that fell alongside many other studies. One of the other things that came out in this New England Journal publication is that some kids are getting quite sick. You know, this is um, an idiosyncratic adverse event. And when people say that most cases are mostly mild, of course that would be true. I mean, that can easily be true. But that's not the same as saying all cases are guaranteed to be mild. Um, that's a fundamentally different claim. And idiosyncratic adverse events will have some distribution of severity. And some will, by chance alone, when the denominator gets big enough, be quite concerning. And you have to take that very seriously. And the reason this discussion is so important is because the age gradient of harm of this virus is so, so steep. It is so, so bad to have an unvaccinated 70-year-old person. That is very, very, very dangerous to that person. Um, I am fearful for that person. And globally, there are many such people, and I would do anything to get them vaccine very quickly. As you fall down in age and as you deal with a real safety signal, you really need to have a very sober appraisal of the risks and benefits. And I think there's a lot of advantages to the one-dose strategy that many European nations have embodied. In fact, I thought that as early as June of this year when we wrote our MedPage commentary, which blew up a little bit on social media, but was very prescient and ahead of its time uh, in terms of analyzing this question. I think the other point I want to make about this is we, we are in a troublesome spot in science, I think, because it is not diminishing an accomplishment to talk about adverse effects. It is not. It really isn't. And it is not making people reluctant to vaccinate by talking about a real safety signal that might change your strategy. If anything, not talking about it makes people a little reluctant. When the initial reaction to VIT after J&J &J vaccine was to downplay it and to compare it to blood clot in the leg, we did a huge disservice to the public because a blood clot in the cerebral sinuses in the setting of runaway platelet activation is not the same as a blood clot in the leg. It never was, and everyone knew that all along. So why was that the instinctual reaction of so much of social media and the media, I think, is a problem. Um, here, myocarditis in this age group for boys uh, is, is not something to be ignored. It is something to take very, very seriously, and I have tried to do so in, across all our writings and our analysis. Um, so what did I learn this week? I learned that uh, other nations have suspended Moderna, which has a much higher rate, uh, possibly two times as high, um, than Pfizer. I have seen, finally, in the mainstream media in the United States, an acknowledgement that other nations are pursuing a one-dose strategy. And we now have an estimate, a very good estimate, in a New England Journal publication that is largely compatible with prior estimates, including the paper by Mandrola and colleagues. Um, there's another paper from Ottawa that has been retracted. And I want to say something. People have difficulty keeping straight John Mandrola and Tracy Beth Hogg's paper, the Ottawa paper, the Ontario analysis. If you don't know the difference between these analyses, you shouldn't go around talking about which paper has been retracted because I see a lot of errors um, among people who are concerned about misinformation, ironically producing misinformation. Um, the last thing I would say, the mandates. Uh, America is a strange place. You know, it's a strange place where you, one day, you don't have an emergency use authorization, and the next day, you're keen on having a mandate. And there's a lot of space in between authorizing an option and mandating it for everybody. And I had a paper out um, in uh, Newsweek where I argued that LA's two dose mandate so that kids could go to public school is problematic. And it really is problematic. And if we are going to do mandates, which I want to be a little bit agnostic on this question, uh, it's not my purview, uh, I, I do think at a minimum, let's have some sensibility around the mandate structure. So does it have to mandate two doses for boys between the ages of 12 and 28? I think that's very problematic when our peer nations are not even recommending the second dose to mandate it as a precondition to go to school. And I wrote about this in Newsweek. Um, 
Does it have to be given in a certain time span? Many of these mandates, you have to give it in a certain period of time uh, where other nations are trying longer dosing strategies to minimize the risk of myocarditis. Um, this is a dangerous precedent. Uh, if you're going to use these powerful forces, of which I have some questions about, uh, I certainly think you shouldn't use it in the place where there is not a global scientific consensus. And this is that place. Um, this is a live issue. The last thing I would say. I think one of the reasons why so many commenters got this issue wrong, and we're just on the wrong side of history here. Um, you know, people have deleted their tweets where they said myocarditis after vaccination is not a thing. And they have tried to minimize the fact that they downplayed it or poo-pooed it or said it wasn't going to materialize or be a real concern. I think one of the reasons they got it wrong was that their mindset and worldview that vaccines are a, a, a tremendous good, which they are was developed in a world where we had a lot of vaccines for quite some period of time and we had a lot of comfort around it. Suddenly enter novel virus, novel vaccine, a lot of uncertainty. Um, they took their old worldview and carried it forward but didn't realize you need a new worldview, which is open-mindedness, which is that it can be a tremendous good for a lot of people. And in fact, the key, I think, to getting past this pandemic is vaccination. But at the same time, that for some ages, we might benefit from some fine tuning. And that's not such a provocative idea. That's, that's usual medicine. Um, but that idea was found to be, I think, quite difficult for many people to process. So I view this, I view these events of this week to be um, a big step forward. They're not a big step forward scientifically because I didn't learn a lot of things I didn't already know. But they're a big step forward culturally because people are now able to talk about this more openly. We finally see mainstream media coverage that other nations are not doing uh, two-dose strategy. Um, I've also seen some mainstream media coverage around other nations' masking policies, which is something that I've been trying to get out there. Um, the moment we start to acknowledge that there are other nations full of very smart, thoughtful, caring physicians looking at these data, reaching different conclusions, the better we can be to have an honest and open dialogue of what we ought to do and what's best for for, for kids of this age. So those are my thoughts on this issue. As always, if you like this video, like, subscribe, comment, leave a message. You know the drill. Until next time.